um, assigned way of an average daily dose of an antibiotic in grams per day. And so if you use kefuroxime 750 three times a day in some patients, kefuroxime one and a half grams three times a day in others, the, the WHO um, defined daily dose is three grams, so roughly one gram three times a day. That's how they assign it, roughly. So it allows you to compare different types of antibiotics. The downside of DDT is it's only set up for measuring antibiotics where you don't change the mix of them. And this is where the DDD system falls down. Anyway, so we set a target, but a simple 1% reduction against the first year we had baseline data, which was 1314. However, we know antibiotic usage has continued to grow in hospitals. So we set three elements. One was to reduce total antibiotics per admission. Now, why did we choose admission? We chose admission because antimicrobial stewardship done well might use slightly less antibiotics per patient. So if you send off the right samples, you'll have something to act on. If you act on the results quicker, you might be able to knock off individual doses. So it's a bit like British cycling. It's all about little gains. Unfortunately, British cycling is probably not the best thing nowadays. Some people think we might bully you into doing antimicrobial stewardship. Um, so how have we done? So we had a target for total about 2.6, because we've seen a 12% rise. We achieved um, over 4%, so that's good. Carbapenems has increased usage by over 30% over a four-year period, and we'd seen more carbapenem-resistant organisms. So we had a target of about 3%, and we've achieved an 11% reduction, and that's pretty impressive. Um, and then piprosil and tazobactam. So do you remember C. diff when it used to be common everywhere? We said, don't use any antibiotics beginning with C. So every in high-risk patients. So everyone interpreted that as, we won't use any antibiotics beginning with C, but we're going to carry on using coamoxiclav because it really is amoxicillin clavulanic. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so we started using piprosillin tazobactam, of which no one's ever heard of because they call it tazacin, even though no, nobody's seen a vial of tazacin in about five years since it came off patent. But our usage increased by over 50% in a four year period. We're giving it to everybody. Uh, somebody always comments that some people have vitamin T deficiency when they come into hospital. And if you give them tazacin, vitamin T, it cures everything. Um, our target there was actually 13% reduction. And we didn't hit the target, but we got a 9% reduction. Um, and then there were some bits about having a proper day three review. And clearly, some people were writing things in notes saying, continue antibiotics. That was a review. So you didn't have to do much to get the money. The good news is this, the unintended consequences of using less antibiotics is we've seen over a 9% reduction in C. diff. Now that's really good news, and that's from reduction in primary care and secondary care of antibiotics. And if you think that one in three patients is dead at three months to get C. diff, it's a really good news story out there. So that's why we have to get people off broad spectrum antibiotics who don't need them. Also, hospital, these are box and whisker plots. So they, they, the box is um, a 25th to 75th quartile. The dark line in the middle is the median. And the, um, the whisker um, is, goes up to zero, to 100%. But what it shows you is the massive variation in all the bits we were doing. And that's what we've really got to try and focus on, is, is getting rid of that variation uh, that exists. Uh, and these are purely just scatter plots. So the gray line, if you're above the gray line, You've increased your usage since the baseline. If you're under, you've decreased it, and you've, therefore you've met the uh, sequin target. If you're to the right um, of the red vertical line, you're using more than the mean or median, and if you're to the left, you're using less. And we've used that for setting this year's things. So if you're to the right of the line, um, so you're a big user, even if you've decreased, you've got a 2% reduction. And my hospital in Leeds is one of those 2% for everything, unfortunately. So, we also asked people to look at the outcome of day three review. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the benefits. And this talks back to some of Enrique's um, thing about antibiotic reduction is not purely around um, um, stopping using antibiotics and resistance. There's lots of extra benefits to this. So this was the data that people sort of put in. It showed that 63% of people continued on the same IV antibiotic um, after day three. Only 10% stopped. 16% switched from IV to oral, so IVOS. 12% um, changed antibiotic, and only half a percent went home on IV antibiotics, OPAP. 
However, these are the benefits. So if you switch someone from IV to oral, it reduces their length of stay by two days. And that's really important because it can actually help free beds up. And that's one of the real pressures we have in the NHS. IV antibiotics take up lots of nursing time. They cost a lot more money. In Leeds, we did a snapshot on one day and we worked out if we switched half the patients who were on IV antibiotics who were eating to orals, we would free up 10 and a half nursing shifts a day. Imagine what you could do in terms of nursing. And that's why I say, if you're a nurse on there and you're giving IV antibiotics to a patient who's eating, they should either be switched to oral or they should go home on IV antibiotics. That's pretty simple to me. C. diff, I told you about already. C. diff is linked to broad-spectrum antibiotics. The most commonly associated antibiotic with C. diff at the moment is the current most highly used broad-spectrum antibiotic, piprocillin tazobactam. It used to be cephalosporins because that's what we use the most of. So whatever we choose to next, it will continue to be it. That's what upsets the gut flora. We'll see less phlebitis and probably less MRSA or MRSA because 12% is device-related. And we're making a real effort about putting OPAT, so home or outpatient IV antibiotics, as a way of freeing up beds. Our service in Leeds frees up 12 beds a day, but it could be double that easily. The good news is, if you treat patients with osteomyelitis, so bone and joint infections, the Aviva study, which was comparing IVs to orals, the results have just come out. Orals are as good as IVs. So that six weeks of IVs could probably turn into six weeks of orals now. So excellent you. So think about reviewing that. In the Netherlands, every patient who's on IV antibiotics is seen at 48 hours. Um, and they're seen by an A team, and they invest 0.1, whole time equivalent of either a microbiologist or other member of staff um, per ward, and they get a return on investment of six times. So if you want a business case for why we need more people doing stewardship, look at this work by Dick. Okay? And the other thing is we've got these regional medicines optimization committees. So the Carter Model Hospital, which is focusing about variation between hospitals, will be focusing on antibiotics, one of the earliest bits and pieces on there, about why there's massive variation. So you need to have a look at that. The other thing is we save lots of money. So this is a graph of um, uh, the expenditure, uh, the usage of um, IV antibiotics versus oral antibiotics. And basically... 20% of the use is in IVs, and it costs 80%. And 80% is, um, is actually orals, and it only costs 20%. So again, if you want to save lots of money, get that switch going on. So we've had lots of challenges. We've had problems with relationships for the sequin, um, trust not taking part, uh, commissions being flexible, trust forgetting how they've suddenly become very sort of excessive in their use of antibiotics. Nobody can remember why they suddenly have quadrupled their amount of carbapenem use. Um, and the money for the sequins not being spent on what it was designed for, improving services. And we're really thinking about getting CCGs to report, ask the trust to re get them to explain what they're spending the money on uh, at the moment. DDs said already doesn't work. If you switch from one thing to another, and I've put an example on here, so switch from piprocillin tazobactam like I've done in Leeds, which was less than one DDD, our alternative is five DDDs. So automatically that penalises me. Uh, we've had problems with data, and we've had massive problems with drug shortages. Back in November, I tweeted, I'm antibiotic Leeds, by the way, I tweeted there was an earthquake in China, and it would affect pip piprocillin tazobactam production. And everyone said, you're just scaremongering. Who's seen any pip taser at work recently? Need I say more? So hopefully we'll have some back in uh, July. So what's happened to resistance? Well, fabulous news. This is from the English Surveillance Programme for Antimicrobial Usage and Resistance, ESPOR report. So um, resistance is stable in pneumococcal and pseudomonas bloodstream infections, stable in TB, decreasing in staph aurea, so MRSA is going down. The bad news is in gram-negative bloodstream infections, um, they're going up. Piptazo resistance is going up. Coamoxiclav resistance is going up. And we're seeing vancomycin resistant enterococci. And that's really quite worrying. Local data in Yorkshire show Piptazo resistance is just starting to turn and go down. So hopefully that will be seen across the rest of the country. We've now made all information on healthcare acquired infections, antimicrobial prescribing, and resistance 
open public data. So you can look at your data for your own GP, for your own hospital, and for your own CCG. And they can look at this around the world. The media will be looking at this. And so this is open data. We're the first country um, in the world who's done this. So go away and have a look at the PHE fingertips. It's a fabulous resource. It also allows you to compare yourself to different organisations. So this is Leeds, and it tells, allows you to see um, if you are basically above the median or whether you're in the 25th to 75th uh, quartiles. And the new whole health economy approach to resistance should be looking at this data so you compare yourselves to your peers and choose your peers yourself. Okay, good news. For the first time ever, we started to see a reduction in antibiotic prescribing across all healthcare settings. General practice, dental practice, secondary care. So that's good news. We've also seen the same happen across all of the countries. So we've seen a reduction in total um, prescribing and broad spectrum. So great news. So we're all doing a good job. So half pat on our backs uh, for each other. The bad news. The bad news is, is whilst we're going great, MRSA is going down, C. diff is going down, um, the graph you can see here is on a 12-monthly change. What's going up? Staph aureus uh, and E. coli. They're the things which are growing, and they're actually killing people. So you can see the mortality rates sort of on that. So the government has said the ambitions, and I'm allowed to say this even during PERDA, because this was signed up for already, and it will be get delivered. So by 2020, we will see a 50% reduction in gram-negative bloodstream infections, and 50% reduction in appropriate prescribing. And we've set a target, and we probably heard about this earlier, a little smidge reduction um, in antibiotics uh, consumption in animals. Um, so we've set these targets. How are we turning that into action? Well, for this year, and so we just started, we've got a reduction in gram-negative bloodstream infections across the whole health economy. So we've set a 10% reduction in E. coli bloodstream infections. We're trying to reduce inappropriate antibiotic prescribing for UTIs in primary care by using less trimethoprim in the over 70s and the ratio of trimethoprim to nitrantoin and a continued reduction in antibiotics. And we've merged already the sepsis and antimicrobial uh, resistance in hospital. And the changes this year, we've kept the sepsis screening the same, but we've changed the um, time for IV antibiotics from 60 minutes from diagnosis. So instead of everyone getting a dose and then thinking about whether they've got sepsis or not, we're saying, let's get the dose in, uh, diagnosis, then give the dose. The empiric IV antibiotic review, because we don't think people were doing it properly, we've made you actually um, really give, start to give us some data. So one, were blood cultures taken? What percentage were positive? What happened at the day three review? And we will use this data probably to go on the Carter Model Hospital dashboard as a way of looking at efficiencies. Was there evidence of your IV to oral switch guideline being applied to all patients? So the bit I've said to you about patients eating on IVs is a standard type of approach, so you can do that. And justifying why you're continuing the same IV antibiotic if you've not got anything back guiding you. And then that 1% or 2% reduction. So how are you doing in this part of the world? Uh, well, this gives you, um, if you go onto the uh, dashboard, it allows you to see against all the indicators how you're doing. And if you're darker purple, then you're actually using more than sort of elsewhere. But you can see on here, this is just graphs of E. coli bacteremias. Generally, in the southwest, it's all going up. There are a few little exceptions. And the ratio of trimethoprim to nitrogen is generally going down in Kerno. So you're doing some really good stuff sort of here, but there's still more uh, work to do. So, in summary, um, AMR incentive schemes as part of the five-year AMR strategy, I think have actually been a big lever for making improvements quickly. Whether you call it carrot or stick, whether it's reward or beating you with something because you're not getting the money, is up for debate. I think it's improved um, reporting of resistance uh, and usage. Um, the setting of targets certainly seen an early reduction in consumption. We have to see if there's any impact on resistance. Um, we've certainly seen improved mandatory education strategy. We've heard a few talks about this already, and we've got loads of tools coming out. And it's giving stewardship a higher priority along, alongside infection prevention control. And it's certainly trying to widen the focus away from C. diff and MRSA. And if I had to take, give a takeaway message for you here is stop working in silos. Let's merge. 
infection prevention control, diagnostics, stewardship in there, sepsis and antimicrobial stewardship into infection stewardship or infection management. Let's work as a big team because together we'll actually achieve an awful lot more. Thank you very much.